All right, so um, how are we going to do this? I, we have about an hour, maybe a little bit more, so I'm going to just uh, throw in a few questions and then we can open it to the audience. Works? Good. All right, so naturally one of the things I would like to talk first, but not exclusively, is this whole issue about education. And so um, education in a broad sense, so one thing we should obviously discuss is, okay, how do we bring this technology to a more broader audience. Um, and then the second is, how do you actually do this within companies? So maybe we start with you, Olga. So, and also the other question, and I had in the same way, is how do we do this that, it, that it's actually not going to take generations, right? I mean, what, with what you do, which is fantastic, are you concerned that you'll only reach so many people and fundamentally it needs an entire almost population transfer, and how are we going to ensure that this is not going to take 20, 40 years? I mean, these are all awesome questions. <laughs> so, so certainly, um, Go for it. I mean, if we're talking about education, we can, um, you know, talk from all the way from very early childhood education all the way to PhD education, let's say. And um, there's sort of some things that are in common and then some things that are, that are very different. So if we're talking about sort of education and, and adoption of this technology in um, college education or for example in PhD studies so we can talk about like what is a good way to structure an undergrad computer vision class such that or an undergrad AI class or whatever the case may be such that this is appealing to the students and appealing to a wide range of students and then and things like that I mean we can talk about that um, I guess to answer your question about is there worry that AI for all will take 20, 30, 40 years before these students become AI technologists. I mean, yes and no. First of all, it's, I mean, a lot of them have actually, like some of our alumni have actually published papers, like AI papers have been, their, their AI papers that they've done since AI for all. So in the past like two years have been accepted for publication. One of them actually just won a best paper award at an IPS workshop. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think it's gonna take 20 or 30 years, um, but, I think it's it's very hard to make change that you I mean change on the scale of, of a year I think that's that's not real change so real change takes time and sort of, certainly sort of raising students that are going to stay in this field for many years that is change if we sort of in the next year you know dramatically increase the number of students doing AI chances are that's not going to be sustainable. I know you asked many questions. I have, I have many answers to all of the questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, go ahead. Um, yeah, what mean, have, what, that, what that's why you're, that's why we invited you because we know you have answers to these questions. Well, <laughs> so. I have opinions on it. Let, let me rephrase. <laughs> I have opinions on all these. Fair questions. enough. It's about the future, so. Um, so what else can I say? So so so. Um, okay, now now I lost my train. Okay, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay, you said sustainability, and I think that's the key element. Um, we are focusing too much on developing better algorithms and training professionals who can develop them, and we're not focusing enough, in my view, on the data. And as long as we're stuck in a paradigm where people work to generate data for others, this won't change. You have little incentive to actually go and do a crappy job that will yield nothing other than a few pennies. And this is where I think the major change must occur. We must turn people from workers into investors. Um, we have an, an initiative with ETH, it's called DataBright, in which we do crowdsourcing on the blockchain. Instead of being paid to do crowdsourcing, people then become owners of the data that they create. This is one way of taking the data problem from a work relation to an investment relation. And this is one way of achieving sustainability. We want a lot of people to be invested in the system and to, be, to have something to gain. You actually brought this problem up earlier. You will not be interested in AI and you won't want to be part of it unless you see that there's something in it for you. I think this is the way forward make a lot of people benefit, even a little, from AI-based systems. And one way of getting there more easily is to make people owners of the data that we work with. And yeah, maybe this is something that you might also be well, thinking about, since 
a lot of people are contributing data to the Google products. It's, I believe ownership is the way forward and distributed of that. So that's, that's a very interesting take, actually. So, so, so um, I think you're completely right. There's, um, so I was actually meaning something different. I think you're not going to be invested unless this is a problem you're passionate about. So, so when you talk about ownership, so to me, that just sounds like, you know, are you benefiting financially? We were talking about benefits. You know, that's what it sounds like to me. Um, so I was just saying that unless you have sort of a personal investment in the problem, you're probably not going to be as committed you know, just for like, yes, it's it's interesting. You know, I th also think writing code is fun and on that's it's fun to do to actually build these systems. But I think true commitment really comes from a certain personal investment in this technology. Like you see it benefiting a particular problem, particular change that you care about. But I really like what you're saying about data as well and where you're heading with that. Well, it's a pyramid, right? I mean, um, some people still need to focus on the base of that pyramid and make sure that this thing is lucrative. Once that is addressed, we can move to more abstract layers of usefulness. But so how do you do that? You, you, um, you said, okay, I mean, there's, you sort of have these scare uh, um, sort of quotes, right? That like it's the greatest technology, but also the last and so on. So like, how do you, translate it to the particular crowd that you address and say, here's, here's concrete problems um, that you, or you know, things you're op optimistic about that you can address. So you start by talking about concrete world problems. I mean, any industry that you name, any application that you name, I can talk about why AI will change it for the better. So we can talk about healthcare, we can talk about education, we can talk about criminal justice, we can talk about uh, poverty, we can talk about sustainability, we can talk about all sorts of things. And in each of those can say, well, here's how through AI you can make an impact for the better. And so instead of teaching AI by starting from, okay, first you're gonna learn how to code in C, then we're gonna teach you Python, then we're gonna teach you databases, then you know, sort of, and then when you're junior in college or senior in college, we're gonna you're gonna take your first AI course. So instead of all of that, we start by talking about here's all the ways in which AI can change the world for the better. And so if you grew up and you were excited to become a doctor, you grew up and you're excited to go and address, uh, um, you know, you have ideas for, you care about sustainability, you care about energy efficiency. So when you hear in that context, here's how AI can help with your particular passion, and then we say, okay, well, so if you want to do that in order to tackle this problem, well, first you need to, you know, learn about some of these algorithms and here's how they're tied in specifically to this problem. So, so like, as an example, so at AI for All of the summer camp, so we actually do research projects with these students, so we break them up into um, groups. Each group is, uh, tackles a particular research problem led by some PhD students who are actually working on this problem. Um, and so, so, for example, at Stanford, so the, the problems were, um, so let me see, I'm going to forget at least one, but one was... Um, uh, natural, dis uh, natural disaster relief through NLP. So suppose you have a natural disaster in an area, um, there's a series of tweets that get sent out from that area. How do you build an algorithm that automatically classifies these tweets into ones asking for help and ones that are asking for urgent help versus ones that are asking for um, help that's maybe not as urgent so as to allow you to reroute to route, um, assistance in a way that's that's optimal. So that's one project and they um, tackle that for a couple of weeks and in the context of that they learn about features, about text features, they learn about bigrams and unigrams and why one feature is maybe more effective than the other, they learn about decision trees, they learn about some machine learning classifiers, um, they write some Python code to actually start analyzing the data, they look at the data, um, but all of this is framed in the context of this problem. So this is one research project. Um, so another one that we did for two years was um, computer vision for smart hospitals. Um, and then uh, last year, actually, the grad students that took over that project actually ended up doing computer vision for poverty mapping. So um, have aerial photographs or with, with the hospital, you have um, actual footage from a hospital. How do you um, run machine learning algorithms on it and computer vision algorithms um, to actually analyze the data? And what can you do once you have that kind of analysis? And two, the third one is, um, 
uh, biomedical informatics. So you have, so genomics essentially, how do you do personalized medicine? And, and the fourth one is around autonomous driving, but we talk about both sort of some of the technology that's going into that. So it's, it's a robotics project. And um, also what is uh, autonomous driving gonna do in terms of accessibility, in terms of allowing the er elderly, allowing um, folks who are disabled to actually have access to the world. So uh, we rely a lot on being able to drive around, particularly in the US. So how do we actually bring that? What this technology that's being built, other than just being cool and lucrative, what else can it uh, actually do for the world? Yeah. Jeremiah, if I can ask you, I mean, at Google, obviously, you contributed to that quite directly. I mean, you know, TensorFlow, TensorFlow Playground, this, these entire frameworks that make it now quite easy to do machine learning, to do AI without first having to go through C, Python, uh, database class, and so on, right? Is that something that factors in at Google when you make the decisions to open source some of that software? Or is it is that something that is on the top of your head? Or it's just also nice to have, and you obviously primarily want to target business customers. Or how do I have to imagine what that discussion looks like about creating and open sourcing these tools? No, I think it's, it's something really important that we uh, focus on. I think a good example of that comes from some colleagues in people in AI research. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of folks here who have downloaded TensorFlow, and that's great to get started. Um, but that's still a little bit of a, of a barrier. Um, so what they've done is they've actually built a really powerful uh, deep learning solution that runs in JavaScript. Um, and the performance they can get with this is amazing. And so this opens up these opportunities to folks who just have um, a browser with, with JavaScript. Um, I think you know, there, are, there are certainly business cases to be made, but that just feels like the right thing for making it easier to include people who certainly don't have C++ background um, and really kind of pull folks who normally wouldn't be excited about dealing with these tools and technologies uh, into a world where they can you know, start experimenting and start creating with deep learning. Right. So, so switching then the side just briefly to, okay, the general public to within an organization. So you've famously created this Ninja program. So can you tell us a little bit about it? And, and also what you're thinking is, I mean, the way I understand it, it's quite intense. It take, seems to take quite a long time. So in that sense, of course, it's also quite costly for the company. Is that something that you think is just a particularity of Google because you're fundamentally increasingly becoming a machine learning based company or do you think do you foresee that becoming something more generally um, in other companies as well yeah I hope I hope it becomes something adopted by other companies so a little bit of uh, background I started at Google in 2005 and moved to research in 2011 uh, I joined a team called Sybil and this team was building infrastructure for the rest of Google to use to do machine learning. Um, and it was, it was this fantastic team. Like there was the, the tools we were building, um, had the best researchers, uh, we had the best engineers building them. And it was amazing to see that get applied to different projects. It'd see projects which felt very similar and we'd get very different outcomes. So it, it really became clear quickly that as much talent and expertise that were going into the research and the tools you know, ultimately, it was going to be an engineer. It was going to be someone uh, using this tool. And we were, we were falling short there. So we started with just having one or two people uh, join our team. And there weren't any formal classes. We would have informal discussions at the whiteboard. But really, the important part was they sat with us. And they were immersed in machine learning. And we gave them the same problems we were working on, right? That's the best way to build up this, this applied knowledge. And so over the years, this is. Uh, this has really grown. There's been a bunch of people who've gotten it to the point where it is today, where we have um, you know, a nice curriculum that runs for about a month. Uh, and it, it is pretty intense. Um, you, know, you show up in the morning. There's usually an hour, an hour and a half class taught by a researcher from Google. And then maybe an hour, an hour and a half lab, where you apply everything. And then you go to lunch. And you repeat that process in the <laughs> afternoon. And then you repeat that day for about three weeks. And you know, the, the goal is to really get people familiar with the tools and some of the techniques. Um, also, just getting to meet other folks who are really passionate about machine learning. That's been a big, um, a big part of the program. And then the folks, they join our team. We give them the problems we're working on. Uh, we actually 
match between the candidates and some other teams. And uh, I think it's a really great sign that all the teams from around Google are always asking if they can get another ninja if they've participated before. Uh, they find them incredibly valuable. And uh, yeah, like, like you mentioned, it is, it is an investment for Google. When we started, I couldn't believe that you know, someone, a manager would give up their best right. engineer for a, for a month or six months for the full, full rotation. Um, but I think understanding the, the importance and you know, it has a multiplicative effect. So if I send my best engineer to the ninja rotation, that engineer is expected to come back and teach. We kind of select people okay. who are gonna do that. All right. right. How do you do Swisscom? How do you, do you, are you just gonna get talent from the outside or are you, well, how do you do well, something like this or plan on doing something Let's like say that, that internally, it's much more informal. We don't have a specific program. So there is an end academy uh, where there is a day or so of classes where on a specific theme, but to the best of my knowledge, ML was not part of the theme so far. We're mostly focused on the interaction with the universities. So there, the, the best example would be our program with master students from EPFL, where we tried to get as much across from EPFL to uh, Swisscom and the other way around. But internally, there is no program that I, uh, I know of. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm learning, so. Good. Is that something you, can you describe that situation a bit at Princeton? How does that work, that interaction between industry and the university? Or, I mean, also Stanford, obviously, I think that we know it a little better because it's in the news all the time. But can you just um, you know, describe your experience a little bit and how you see that evolving? Yes, um, so I just got to Princeton, so it's been it's been six months. Okay. Um, so 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 keep that in mind. Yep. Um, I'm still trying to figure out. So so I feel like there's less interaction with the industry than at Stanford, and I think that was that's expected. Um, so Stanford certainly being placed in in the heart of Silicon Valley, there's there's a lot more interaction and a lot more um, you know faculty who are part time at various companies or who are, there's a lot more sort of consulting and also a lot more students going to um, internships, but then not just going to internships, but actually staying longer and sort of, you know, will um, do a research internship, then kind of hang around for another three months in order to get something publishable out and things like that. Um, I've seen less of that at Princeton, so students definitely do internships, so there's very, um, very much of that, and, and um, individual faculty do definitely collaborate with with industry, um, so, so I sort of hesitate to say that. So, so I'm pretty sure there's less, but also I've been there six months. So I'm starting to kind of build up collaborations with industry and certainly again, kind of in AI and in computer vision, of course there's gonna be lots of collaborations with industry. Like there's lots of resources, but also there's just lots of wonderful people in industry working on really cool things and, and there's problems and there's also solutions coming out of industry that are, um, part of our research community, right? So, so we are ultimately all working towards the same goal of building better AI systems. And certainly some of the answers are coming out of academia, some of the answers are coming out of industry. And so of course there has to be um, very uh, close interactions between the two. Mm -hmm. So on, on that note, um, you know, let's say there's, I mean, there's obviously plenty of businesses who are interested in machine learning. And I think that's, you know, why events like this exist and are increasingly popular. So then what do you do, right? I mean, then if you happen to be around EPFL or Stanford or Princeton, maybe you can try to reach out to some of the faculty, but they're all busy writing grants and what have you. Um, or you can reach out to industry directly, but I assume there's often a massive mismatch, right? Between, and you talked a little bit also about this, between the expectations sometimes coming in and between what you do, you mean you sort of do world-class research and you know, cutting edge, I mean, you drive a lot of the machine learning ecosystem forward. Is there, is there an entire gap that's not being addressed at the moment or do you feel like this is very typical and natural match? Um, I, think, I think there is a gap. I'm Trying to think how to do this without it sounding like an advertisement, uh, but in in our um, in our cloud organization, which is now headed by Fei Fei, um, we're we're looking to address that. In particular, the uh, Advanced Solutions Lab is an external model 
for what we have internally in the applied machine intelligence team. So you know, it has the same boot camp format followed by really, uh, really close work with engineers to understand and apply machine learning to something. So I think there is, there is some opportunity to, uh, to fill that space and um, I hope we're doing a good job of that. I'm also going to try to not sound um, too, um, too much like a salesman. Um, there is a broad range of clients who have needs um, uh, that we could, or other firms could address. Um, I think an important first step is to have a consultant or a person who understands the business side in the room. Sitting there with the client and understanding the need is 50% of the job. A business consultant within, for example, Swisscom, you mean? For instance, or it can be an external. We have worked with external firms and we have worked with a consultant company that is now part of Swisscom and, so we, and with Swisscom consultants. So um, there is a whole range of possibilities there, but understanding the client's needs is a very important first step. And if you don't do that, then the whole process takes way longer. So but but how do you how do you think about the other side? You know, if you put yourself into the shoes of this of this company, and and there is perhaps not a good understanding of what's currently happening in this space, because it's also hard, right? I mean, uh, it, it's 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 somewhat the messaging is very diffuse to some extent. I mean, I think your CEO was just here in the um, in the media because he he said that that uh, AI is as big as electricity and fire. And then, right, so how do you then sort of take such a statement and say, okay, I need to, like, how does it affect my business? You so, need also the technical understanding of that in the first place, right, in the company. I think most you people are aware of their level of understanding. So they, think? Yes, um, at least the ones that I've spoken to, they know that something big is up. They just don't know how to tackle it and then they go and ask for help. Okay, I have this problem, how could I actually do this? So most people are aware that there is a solution, but they just need the dots to be connected. And usually there is an in informal first step that needs to be taken to connect these dots. Is that something you notice too? I mean, I, th I think you can do an awful lot without the actual machine learning, right? So right. certainly, if you, if you plan on doing machine learning, making sure you're, you're logging and you have this data at, at some point. So you want to start doing that right away. Um, but th there's also this danger of deciding on a technology and then forcing it, right? So even, even if you don't know anything about machine learning, if you spend time thinking about your product, thinking about what your users want, thinking about how you can make their lives better, then once you have a very solid idea of that, then we can start thinking about how to turn that into an objective function and which modeling approach we should use. Um, but if, we, if we're consulting with the team and the first thing they say, um, even before they tell us what they're building is they want to use an LSTM, that's a, that's a big red flag. That's almost certainly right. going to end in tears. Okay. Is so it, you're advocating you, for the existence of baselines. <laughs> this is this is my pet peeve. Exactly what you're saying. I ask a student, "What problem do you want to work on?" And they tell me, well, "I'll take an LSTM and then I will run it." And I say, "No, no, no, no. What's your input? What's your output?" And they say, "Oh, it's an LSTM." I say, "No. What is the problem?" This is so. I very much relate to that. Right. To be honest, I have never had this problem. <laughs> I have it on a daily basis. I have students on a daily basis come in and say things like this. That's that's impressive. Since since uh, LSTMs were invented just around the corner from here, maybe we should try to get uh, Jurgen again on stage. Um, but, but, but quickly, we, we really do run into the yeah. I want to I want to harp on this yeah, a yeah, little sure. bit. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so yeah, everybody kind of jumps to the most complex solution that's really uh, intellectually appealing. And to be honest, for machine learning, we really see people get huge benefit uh, just by using the simplest counting methods, right? So just doing the simplest thing you can imagine will kind of get you 60 or 70% of the way there. Maybe using machine learning on top will get you to 80, 85%, and really, really good machine learning will get you to 95%. So if you're doing something like trying to predict what the temperature is going to be tomorrow, you start with a model that just says whatever the temperature was today, and that's going to be pretty good, and you start building from there. 
you don't immediately go to some something fancy with an attention yeah. mechanism. Yeah. And, and, and uh, another question I have for you in particular, Jeremiah. I mean, uh, you know, at the same time, you guys. I mean, you're you're obviously very much at the cutting edge of this technology. You have a, a very broad overview, I guess, over what's going on. You have tons of data in pretty much any domain. Um, is it is there sort of tension also between between your customers and Google? Because I mean, I could sometimes it feels like whatever you guys could tackle, you know, you could probably, you know become one of the top players immediately in any field, whether that's healthcare, whether that's finance or what have you. Is that something that you you feel on a daily basis when you when you interact with, with your you know business customers or or not? They're completely cool with that. Yeah, I think I think uh, if I understand right, kind of within our team, um, we really have to be conscious about how we prioritize our time. Right. Uh, you know, just about any any project we work on, we can probably make some headway with. So it's exactly. it's more about what we what we don't work on, and really trying to quickly evaluate. Uh, you know, is this something that's going to be impactful to the product? Is this something that's going to um, make users happier? And we really try to prioritize there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, do you, um, Olga, what's your relationship with industry? You're getting tons of requests, I imagine. How do you deal with that? And, and is that what should happen? Or do you say, sorry, you're, you're speaking to the wrong person. I'm an academic. Please speak with these companies. How do you handle that? Um, so it, it depends. So, so the, the toughest request, of course, were, were after, after I finished my PhD and sort of was leaving to um, go to Pittsburgh to Carnegie Mellon for a postdoc, and there were certainly requests then, and that was kind of the right time to convince me not to stay in academia, but to go to industry. Um, so to me, I am passionate about academia. I want to be in academia. I'm exactly where I want to be. I actually find it kind of funny when I get approached for sort of full-time offers, and sometimes with kind of this attitude of like, well, you just haven't heard the best offer, or, well, you know, you're only in, um, academia because you know you haven't really gotten the kind of offer that you want from industry and that's not true so i'm in academia because i want to be in academia i fought hard to be in academia i'm going to um i'm very happy there and um again it's been very crazy six months starting as an assistant professor is a ridiculous amount of work um but it's wonderful and i love it um uh, how do i deal with offers that are sort of consulting offers i i value it whether it's something that I care about doing. I evaluate whether it's interesting. I evaluate whether it fits in um, with what I'm currently working on, in particular, sort of the question of time, of course, is always the question. So, so any number of hours that I spend consulting gets subtracted from time that I'm working on research that I want to be working on or that I'm doing sort of stuff at Princeton, stuff with students that I want to be doing. Um, so it depends. So some some consulting things and some interactions with with industry are actually very rewarding and certainly things that um, benefit my students in some ways. I, I definitely will prioritize so, so so collaborations in the sense of you know a student doing an internship that then um, kind of becomes a longer term collaboration that's uh, consistent with their research trajectory. That sounds wonderful. Um, kind of one off things that are just basically a way for me to make money. I mean, money is always good, but at the same time, again, like I'm exactly where I want to be. I'm like, I love my job and it's, uh, I, yeah, unless, so, so usually unless, I mean, unless it's something interesting that I care about, I just would rather keep doing stuff that I'm already doing. Right. And how do you guys view sort of the interplay between um, academia and industry, specifically also on the educational side, right? Because I think we're seeing, you know, on the one hand, I mean, academia is sort of becoming more dynamic, more business oriented, you know, sort of that whole innovation transfer, tech transfer, of course, it's been there forever, but now it's really heating up a lot. At the same time, companies are getting more into, into the educational space. What's, what's, where is this heading? Where's a good equilibrium? Do you know what I mean? So there's some people, I mean, at the extreme case, right, I could argue people being concerned that, you know, academics do too much sort of business stuff, in quotes, which I don't subscribe to. 
Um, on the other hand, you hear concerns that large companies are getting too much in the education space and sort of, you know, not being fully neutral. Um, you know, that's also not good. So how, how, do you, how do you think about this issue? So I don't think there's an answer that maps to all of the types of academia. Yeah. Okay, so in Switzerland, for instance, there are a lot of institutes and a lot of um, Hochschule, um, well, un applied universities, and then you have ETH and EPFL in a league of their own. I don't think the same answer would map to all of these. There are applied projects that are well suited for a master's student in uh, Yverdon that might be less suited for a PhD student at EPFL. So if we have this case by case reasoning, I would say that the most important thing for all is to be open about the result. And this is something that we've advocated from day one. If we're working with academia and we're not allowed to publish the findings, then this is all, it's, it's wasted time for everyone. So being able to publish, open sourcing the code. But why would you not be able to publish? Like who would prohibit it? There is a practice in industry of going to academia to get a job done mm -hmm. with some proprietary data. And if that data is closed, okay. then any findings would be, wouldn't be replicable. All right. If but you don't so from industry side, it yes. would be prohibited. Okay. Just to be clear. So I, I don't think that's the way forward. I think any collaboration should lead to open results and to open code. So yeah, that would be my, uh, it, it's definitely and is not. And that, is that the case now at Swisscom? This has always been the case. Always yes. been the case, yes. okay. Same at Google or what's the situation there? Yeah, by and large, our first instinct is to publish both the tools and, yeah. the, and the research. I think that's really encouraging. Um, I also think it's really encouraging that a lot of the, um, I don't want to use the word influence. A lot of uh, the tools that are making the way from from Google into academia are are open source, so they can right. be um, taken or left. Yeah, um, that seems like a really a really good dynamic versus you know if we were to donate software packages uh, that were you know thousands of dollars a seat. Um, so you know, th that feels like there's some safety built into that open source dynamic. Yeah, com completely agree with that. Completely agree with publishing. Completely agree with open source, and and absolutely agree with the case by case basis. Like it's very hard to do generalizations. It's whatever is, in my yep. case, whatever is best for the yep. student, or whatever is base, best for the company, for the team, for the particular person working on a particular problem at the team. Yeah, completely yeah. agree. About that, we've had a visit to a major AI institute in the Italian part of Switzerland, um, and. They were stunned that we went to them not with a problem to solve, but with an offer to actually collaborate on some research topics. Mm -hmm. Because it was the first time, they said, when people actually wanted to do research from the industry with them. They, mm -hmm. they, they were very used to being given problems. Mm -hmm. That's the part that I would want to change. Mm -hmm. This perception that industry only uses academia mm -hmm. to get some problems out of the way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, but uh, so to, uh, and and then after we're gonna we're gonna open it up. Um, but still, so this this question of okay, I mean, I'm a company. I know probably from all these great talks that I've heard and what I read in the newspaper, machine learning can be help can help me solve my problem potentially. Then then what? Then do I build machine learning expertise in house? Do I go to some of you guys, do I even just say, okay, you know what, I'm just going to use, I hear there are companies who provide these, you know, machine learning as a service through APIs, am I just going to send, you know, everything there and get all the classifications back and then be happy with it, or is that a danger because really I'm sort of outsourcing intelligence and eventually I become, so how, what is the right answer there? And case by case is not accepted as an answer. All of the above. <laughs> No, so as a channel, is there a general answer to this? Do you have a big budget? If yes, <laughs> everything is on the table. If not, try not to spend 90% getting data that you then cannot even curate, for instance. This would be one guideline. Okay, if you're trying to build 
a speech-based system and you need to gather the speech data and then you can't even afford the costs to keep that data and make it accessible to the donors so that they can delete their contribution going forward. So if you can't incur those costs, don't do it. Um, it's, it's all about how much it costs to build and to maintain. How do you view this at Google and then also all the reviews? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I would be very clear to develop um, a good sense for what you want to solve. And then I would start by finding people who are incredibly passionate about solving that. Um, inside or outside? Uh, inside, inside. So speaking from, from Google, we, we like to see this, this clear idea of the product and then a lot of interest in solving it and not necessarily a commitment to using machine learning. Um, but we, uh, we have a, a few different levels we consult with teams that come to us that have those, those properties. Uh, we'll do a shallow consultation, which might take an hour. Turns mm -hmm. out an hour at the very beginning of a project can do a lot to set uh, a team in the right direction. Uh, or if it's important or interesting enough, we'll do a deeper engagement where we actually put our engineers with the team. We'll sit with them and everything. Um, so that feels very important. And also, in addition to having working with a team that's passionate, I think finding a team that is excited to share what they learn, right? That's how you get this uh, super linear effect where uh, you, know, you take someone, you train them, and then they come back and they're an ambassador and they kind of bootstrap the rest of the team to, uh, to do machine learning. You partner with academia and give some <laughs> research lab a lot of money and then you watch what they produce. I mean, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. And I've, again, I've only seen sort of the, the companies that go the route of let's partner with, with an academic, yeah. right? So, so I've, I've seen that approach. Um, it can fail sometimes if uh, there's not enough of a conversation. So, so if sort of um, folks come to us and kind of say, okay, I want this problem solved. Here is X amount of money. Can you just go do that? So that, that generally does not work. That's, that's, yeah. That, yeah. that's going to fail because we're going to do research that we find interesting. It's probably not going to solve that problem. Uh, it's, that problem is probably not solvable. Chances are, and, and so, um, but what's much more effective is again, you start building up the collaboration over time and kind of start um, learning about what is actually the limitations of that technology. And part of it can be, again, I've only seen really one strategy, it's, it's done through a collaboration with an academic lab. Yeah. Excellent. So maybe let's turn on the light a little bit in the hall and then um, get some mics going. Um, but it will be hard to do that without more light. Perfect. All right. Hello. Any questions? Over here in the back. Hi, my name is Bharat. I work for a really large pharmaceutical life sciences company called Merck. I'm going to go straight to the question you asked, Marcel, about how do people that come to these events take back you know, the, the understanding of these concepts and then apply it to achieve some breakthrough, right? The big challenge I see in my company is that we have really knowledgeable business people. We have world-class data scientists. Some of them are in the room. And we have really strong IT guys, data center operations people, OK? But these are three silos. The business guys don't know much about data science or IT. The data scientists are not pharmaceutical or life sciences people. They know the technology. And the operations guys you know, are not really working with the algorithms, right? So the opportunity that I see and where I look for your feedback is that as an industry, I think we need to start thinking about having a glue that brings these groups together. Because if that doesn't happen and there's not this empathy or understanding, then we're just going to keep doing what each groups are doing. And it almost feels like the, you know, from two decades ago where people said, we need business analysts to translate requirements to you know, dissipate the tension between the, the business guys and the programmers, it feels like the new BAs have to be these data science architects, if you will, that can bring these parties together. I'm just curious to hear your input on this. Uh, 
L loaded question. Um, first of all, the glue is beer. <laughs> um, um, okay. <laughs> Uh, jokes aside. Not in this region. Go okay, ahead. wine. Go ahead. Um, we, they, there are consultants that are specialized in solving exactly this problem, in identifying where the miscommunications are internally, and then matching the skills that you already have with the business need that was maybe unspoken. So this communication process can be facilitated by someone from the outside. And this is sometimes standard practice. But that's the only answer I have. I think, I think that's a good one. Um, kind of on a smaller, more bottoms up, we've had a lot of luck with hackathons. Um, so potentially getting a few folks from, from each one of those silo and silos and uh, having them attend Applied ML Days next year and participate in, in a hackathon, which I I hope you have again. Um, I think things as, as simple as that, as that have been really effective in forming cross-organizational uh, connections, at least within within Google. And you know, those those have grown into bigger things over time. So. More questions? There's a question there, or there, and there. Can I, can I go? Yes, well, yes, whoever has the microphone has the power. Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Ardo Özdemir. Can you wave? I don't know, oh, there, Here. thank you, thank you. Uh, my question was going to be about the ethical considerations that go into uh, when deciding what technology to work on or what uh, application you you work on. So. To summarize, can you ever walk away from a project that will give you lots of profit or lots of uh, research grant, but it's uh, ethically questionable? Thank you. Well, let me guess that uh, what the answers yes. are going to be. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, it's generally a good question. We should maybe delve a little, uh, but, but first, um, Let's just see. Maybe we have surprises in the answers. <laughs> yes, I've walked away from projects that I didn't think were interesting. But ethically, were, were you? I mean, without I that is not even a. No, sure, but, but I think what would be interesting is to hear from you. Does that happen with a certain frequency, actually, or 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 did, are people smart enough to never even approach you with that? So again, I've been pro a professor for six months. So um, machine learning. It month. has. I'm sorry. These are long machine learning months. Uh, right. So 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 fair fair enough. Um, it's hard to comment on frequency. Um, I cannot imagine a situation where it wouldn't. Like I cannot imagine any amount of research. I mean. So, 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 so again, I like research grants. My lab runs on research grants. Research money is important, very much. I can't imagine a situation where there's an X amount of money that I wouldn't turn down if I think it wasn't ethical. What if it's not about the money? What if uh, instead of having money or a request from N the NSF would be from the NSA? Uh, and? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the beauty of being an academic, right? Is that and, and you can choose what you want to work on. And what, it's, it's almost like it's, it's basically my job to choose what to work on. Like, that's, that's essentially what my role is. Well, since you have a mic, what, what, what's your... Uh, how often is Swisscom confronted with things that are so, actually unethical but make you loads of money? Okay, maybe I haven't been with the company for, for any uh, time, <laughs> but um, we haven't had a problem where someone came with, an, with a request that was not ethical. Mm -hmm. We did have one Ooh. situation where, okay. um, the, um, let's say, the topic was not a feel-good topic for uh, our data scientists. It's about increasing the sales level and just pushing stuff on people that it might, they might not actually need or manipulating them. This was not something that... We're, we were okay with. 
so um, yeah, this is definitely a factor that did come up and we then pushed it to management and we're not working on that right now. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think uh, a lot of times it's, it's not something that's blatant, right? Like right. Um, someone exactly. will come up with a project to um, make ATMs spit out cash so yeah. that we can, can <laughs> grab it all, right? A lot of times it's, it's much more subtle and those things, yeah. I think it's important to really be clear about what you're, what you're trying to do and what's important um, for, for your customers or for your users. So as an example, let's say that you were building a, um, a, a video recommendation system, right? Your, your first instinct might be, oh, you know, we want people to click on lots of videos. So you build a model to optimize for clicks. And if there's one thing I've discovered working at Google for almost 13 years is people love clicking on videos that have people falling down or people wearing bathing suits. So when you build this model, that's you know, all it wants to show. Of course, that's a bad user experience. It's not great for the, the user in the long term. People click on videos, they go back right away. Um, so I really think that if you are conscious about what the user should be getting out of it, you can bake that into your objective function um, and avoid a lot of these, uh, you know, maybe smaller ethical issues. Yeah, but do you, I mean, you know, if I listen to you, and from my own experience, you're right. I mean, that's sort of the beauty of, of being in research, where you can also take sort of the longer view. Obviously, in the real world, your constraints are sometimes more severe. We hear a lot about that. Uh, I think there was just this, this Jeff Bezos video that was going viral, where he said you should always think about the quarter in, in three years, because the other ones are already done. But in, in reality, do you have this kind of leeway? Do you have this kind of freedom? To, to sort of think in those terms, to sort of say, okay, this is an interesting project that's gonna be really cool for our customers in five years. Mm -hmm. is, does, that, does that get thumbs up or? So I think so, especially within the research organization. Right. I think if you go all the way back and look at the founders letters, you know, they're very clear that they're gonna pursue things that they think are interesting and impactful and not necessarily um, things like a stock price. Yeah. Um, so it's great to have that, that support and that, that charter. And along the same question that I asked Sumit before lunch, how does how do we have to think about you know research trickling down to actual Google products? What's the process and the speed of that? Um, it's very quickly. I think if if people are familiar with the photo search, this is where you uh, type in beaches and you see pictures of beaches that you've taken. I think that whole integration took about six months, which is which is pretty quick. Yep. Um, so the fact that we sit right next to these teams and work with them, um, you know, it is expected that when a technology is ready, that we can get it out there really quickly. Yep. Okay. But you, but you always that has to be the goal, or do you have the freedom to say, I'm just going to follow this? Be that could potentially be theoretically interesting, but prob or do you have from day one to sort of come up with a potential use case? Um, it depends. Our team, we're much more focused on having that use case and driven by it, as we okay. saw, uh, to really get that frontline experience. But our sister team, the brain team, a lot of their research is much more theoretical and uh, has a little bit longer time horizon. Okay. Can you answer that question, too? And in the, in the meanwhile, could we get the microphone to the next person while you answer the question? Well, the smaller the company, the shorter the time frame. Right. So, having said that, we do have a partnership with EPFL for seven years. Um, so that is a long-term commitment. Sure. And we are working on AutoML, which will not bear fruit for some years. Yeah. So we can go crazy, but that cannot be the norm. Sure. Um, most of the projects need to have a clear goal and results within a six months time frame. Six months? Yes. Okay. All right. We had, we had the... Yeah. Uh, so this is a question about um, the privacy of customer data. So I believe the GDPR comes into effect this year. And I was wondering for Google and Swisscom, how much of an impact this has on machine learning and whether the quality of the data will degrade if you have to pseudo anonymize it and so on. All right, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> the big uh, problem with data was for us in speech. We actually had to delete corpus that was not okay in terms of um, licensing. We didn't know who those people were anymore. We couldn't trace back to them. 
So we just deleted the corpus and that was painful. However, having done so, we're now, let's say we're, we're not impacted by May. Um, we were, we've been May. looking, May 2018 when GDPR um, takes, goes into force. We, we knew that this was coming. So um, we were lucky enough to have a very young team. Um, the AI uh, team is less than one and a half years old. So having known from the start, that was not me, I hope. Um, having known from the start that GDPR is coming, we didn't do anything that we would then have to redo because of it. I think we're in a, in a very similar, similar place. In general, we tend to um, want to be out in front of these things as, as early as we can. So I think the, the impact will be um, pretty small. Yeah, um, yeah, a question here. To jump back on the talks you gave this morning about inclusivity and diversity and also on the recommendation systems. Um, so AI learned a lot from data, from actual data, from reality, whatever bias that includes. And in some cases, especially for recommendations when it's come to health or education or job offers and things like that, how do you deal between what's the reality and uh, what's, what would be an ideal fair recommendation? Absolutely. Ongoing research project with um, colleague Arvind Narayanan at Princeton, a uh, very, very active area of research. Um, very good question. So data captures the distribution of the real world. Where is the balance between learning from this data, which is going to show the current economic inequality, the current um, state of affairs, and the current state of diversity in various fields, the, all of the various problems that the world has. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. And this is where the question of objective comes in very directly. So um, the approach that doesn't work is being blind to attributes like gender and race and just saying, okay, we're just not gonna collect this in the data and then we're just gonna learn and it's gonna be fair. So that does not work without a doubt. What works is being very mindful of uh, the kind of biases that you'd like to uh, avoid and in particular, the kind of fairness. Um, and there's many different definitions of fairness. There's many notions of fairness. There's more and more research being done around how you can define fairness. So being mindful of what you're trying to achieve. And then, so, so this comes back to what you were saying earlier, right? So, so if you know what the goal is, if you know what kind of fairness you want to achieve, if you know that, um, let's say, for, you know, for e, you know, you're thinking about particular groups of people, for each group, you know, you want the model to make decisions that um, enforce a certain, you know, error rate that's the same across all groups. So it kind of makes it's equally accurate on all groups or do you want the model to like what it can you precisely define what you, what the notion of fairness is and then if you can that's from there you train an end-to-end -end deep learning model to enforce this notion of fairness so uh, hello uh, my name is pavel i'm uh, one of our organizers of machine learning meetups here okay uh, in Lausanne. <laughs> and i have a question from my personal experience what kind of strategies you have when you are dealing with your colleagues, let's say from your group, or especially with your boss or manager, to communicate about magics of machine learning, that it's complete, they don't know anything about it, and everything is great as, you, as, as long as your results are good, uh, but let's say you have some cha challenging results or long period of two months without uh, progress. What do you do with this? My boss is my department chair, who is also a professor in computer science who knows about machine learning, so not a problem. Oh. Oh, let's see. I don't know if I have any effective techniques, but I can say we, we see this a lot, right? A lot of the applied machine learning practitioners in Google, you know, they used to be engineers, and that's a really different day when you go in as a, as a software engineer. You, know, you can sit down and look at the, the profile of a server, and if you hack away at it long enough, you're going to speed it up. You can, you can almost always make progress every day. Um, 
but machine learning is is different, right? It's kind of more quality based. It's more experimental. You're going to have 20 great ideas, and each one is going to be the best idea you've ever had in your life, and you're sure it's going to work. And you know, 19 out of those are are going to fail. Um, so we see this a lot, and at least morale-wise, we find it important to kind of have a mix of these kind of quality, these machine learning applications, as well as infrastructure, just to kind of um, you know have something where concrete progress can be made. So so folks don't lose all hope, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, other other than um, you know, really really supporting things with numbers and making sure they understand what is possible with machine learning, I think that's that's all I've got. Um, we added an attention model, um, so having multiple um, projects ongoing and they don't really follow them all in detail, we can focus their attention on the ones that perform the best and where new results appear with a higher frequency. That seems straightforward. Yes. Hello, um, Michael Tangermann from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, I have a question that might be interesting for a lot of the students around too. Like if a um, scientist or a master student that finishes with a, after studying some data science topic goes into industry, this transition process um, may be interesting. There's different attitudes in academia compared to industry, um, different um, expectations and so on. So what do you experience if people do this transition? What are the biggest problems to struggle with? They shouldn't even be doing this. They should stay in, in uh, academia. <laughs> of course. No, but but also concretely to add on on that, I mean, what, yeah, I mean, sort of what would be, because we, we can tap on your back, uh, on our backs uh, all day long, but when you look at the transition from um, academia to industry, and I'm essentially just repeating the question, but where do you say this you guys are not doing well? It's, it's not necessarily a question of not doing well, but no, no, what, is, what is so different such that, you know, those that transition are surprised or need to adapt? Which guys, I would argue, we're not doing so, we're not preparing them necessarily well for what's coming. Yeah. I have very few examples to go on, but the um, few master students that we had one year ago, um, they, mo most of them stayed on as colleagues. And the transition, I don't think, was um, that difficult because they, well, kept the same working environment and the same colleagues. However, what they do now changed. So they, I, I would say that the work is more applied. Um, I'm not sure if they like that too much. And uh, I'm not sure how we could have done this better. But this is the major change once they went from student to employee that sometimes you have to work now with data that is no longer open or you have to work on a problem that serves a client and is not as fun anymore. For that person. Yes. <laughs> so so I, I think there are some, some technical answers, but one thing I think is surprising for a lot of people is that the, the job changes, especially with our team, right? So certainly we want people who are very technically proficient, but um, a lot of what we do is talking to other teams and building those relationships and really understanding a product from a user experience and a UI standpoint. Um, so that's incredibly important. And having to really focus on educating. So these aren't necessarily you know, things that you see in a typical job description, um, but you see them you see them in ours, so they're they're quite important. And um, luckily I think we're we're doing really well diversity wise and it was easy for us to build a team that kind of excels at, at this. But so that's that's why I was asking and then maybe you can also jump in on that. But I mean there's to some extent there's a certain tension, right? I mean as a 
you know, as a, as a, as a university, I mean, th the goal is not just to get the students just the latest applied skills, but to actually give them what we call here these polytechnical skills, right, that will carry them through the next 50 years, you know, to whatever new thing comes along that they actually have the background to master that. But then, um, and then th there's some tension then with what the industry needs. I think that's fine, that's manageable, but what you just said is very interesting. And I also remember that I think you released quite a bit of data and research on which teams perform best. And, and that sort of these skills, like interpersonal skills and all that is actually much more important at the end of the day than who can invert the tree the fastest on a whiteboard. Um, there, we're probably not yet doing the greatest job, right, of sort of preparing people for that kind of reality. Um, I would argue, do, do you, what do you think about uh, how you see that? I mean, you think, no, 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 we should just purely be on the sort of academic aspect and the rest is not important? I mean, that, that, that was a lot of questions in, in one. So there's the question of sort of interpersonal skills and then communication skills, um, which I argue so, 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 so at the PhD level, we certainly teach that, right? And that's a big part of like PhD program is, is um, interpersonal sort of communication skills and, and um, being able to give talks, being able to communicate about your research, that's certainly emphasized. At what point does that get emphasized early on? I think it depends on, it, the university, the classes you take, the sort of what your experience is like. I think that's um, underemphasized. The question of practical skills versus sort of, um, I mean, again, it sort of depends, right? So, so you've mentioned TensorFlow before. So a lot of students coming out of universities now who work on computer vision or work on deep learning will have used either TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever um, open source frameworks. So they're trained in that, which will directly translate to skills that they're going to be using. So can I again say case by case? <laughs> I can. like that answer. You can, no, no, we're talking, at the end of the day, we're talking about the real world, so it's fine if it's, um, okay, any more question? There's um, here and then probably okay. up there. Uh, okay. yep. Modest Korf, um, Idorsia Pharmaceuticals in Basel. I have a question concerning the, um, issues of machine learning and um, regarding explanatory models. So far, machine learning is constructing statistical models, which are working very well. I mean, there is a really huge progress, which was also um, brought here to the auditorium. Many thanks for it. But so far, humans in, in natural science, they are working slightly differently. Um, humans observe something for example, falling an apple from a tree and then they see it fall again from the tree and after some observations, uh, they came up with that there exists something like gravity. And then they introduced gravity into science, uh, which was one of the biggest steps forwards in uh, modern science. Um, so far, I cannot observe anything similar um, from machine learning. So machine learning, does not derive explanatory models. And it is far away from bringing up the questions which are needed to do the progress into this direction, to put the right questions, which can then brought into an experiments, which will then answer the questions. Is there any chance that machine learning will be able at one point to construct explanatory models, which is of really high importance in science, which is related to natural science like pharmaceutical industry. All right. Yes. <laughs> yes, what? The, the question was if there's any chance of that happening. Okay, what is yes. the chance? Let me, um, let me It's important to note that machines right now do not reason with concepts the way we do. And important steps have been taken in the last year to make machines deal with concepts in a more human fashion, to derive concepts as intermediate levels of knowledge representations that can then be reused in an efficient and human-like fashion. Right now, all uh, the work I'm referring to 
is about playing tic-tac-toe. So those concepts, having an X or an O, are not extremely um, neither diverse nor complex, but I think they're a step in the right direction. Without having this conceptualized view of the world, we probably can't go far, as you well noted. But people are taking note of the problem and they are coming with solutions. So the answer is yes, we can get there. So can you comment on that? Well, this whole issue of explainability. And is, is, it, for, for, is it something for when you interact also with your clients, is that something that is actually on top of their mind or first get the problem solved and let's talk about explainability later? Um, so, so, yeah, just kind of looking at why there might not have been a lot of progress in finding explanations. I don't think a lot of the, the research or the focus has been on doing that, right? We're using machine learning to solve a problem, to learn a function. And we're starting to see some cases where you know, we use it to help us be creative, right, with music and things like that, um, which, is a, which is a little different focus. So I'd imagine in the future people will start to focus um, on building models that really help us understand our environment and maybe point us in the right direction to you know, figure out what questions we should be asking and what we as humans should be, should be working on. And, yeah. Yeah, All right. I've seen further questions, and so, I want to get a couple because we're, we're running out of time. Yes. yes. So, uh, Robert van Kommer from EPFL. Um, I have the chance to work on, on many uh, innovation projects related to machine learning and how to apply that to the market. And over the time, I'm seeing that uh, there are some differences between projects, machine learning projects that are applied and research projects where the data set is already available. So, and one of the points is exactly that. So there is no data available when we start applying machine learning. So, and I was very excited this morning because the, this point was addressed by both Swisscom and others. So uh, there's another quote from a researcher that is Vapnik that tells this much, much more practical than a good theory. And the question is, are you going to apply or change the focus of the research to tackle precisely those problems where not available data, not enough data is available at the start? Yes. That's every research problem. We never have enough data available. However, it's very difficult to convince management of the importance of data. Um, we should not understate the difficulty of explaining this simple problem. When you ask for money to generate a better algorithm that um, then turns into plus 10% in some measurable figure, that's simple to explain, simple to understand, and simple to get the money. When you want to build a new way of sourcing data, or you want to build a community to do so, it's much harder to get that point across. I would say that this is a difficulty that needs to be overcome through better education. Okay, we have two more minutes. Let's take one more question. And um, I know there's there's plenty of people in the back, um, but um, let's see who d you decide. Whoever has a microphone, go for it. Hello. Yes. My name is Alex Sokorowska. Um, I'm very happy that towards the end I can ask this question. Uh, so I wanted to talk a bit about diversity, and I think it's um, particularly di uh, gender diversity. I think it's a very important topic if, when we're discussing AI in the new world, in the real world. Um, as we know, I can, we don't have many women working in the t tech fields, and this field is uh, evolving rapidly. And uh, it's great to be investing in the future generation, so to go to schools and uh, promote those fields among the um, younger generation. But between then and um, in the future, when they will actually go after their computer science studies and will be developing things that will change the world, will be many years that will pass. And this field, you know, who knows how, what the world's going to look like then, how much progress we will make. And, um, so it would be great, I think, and I guess a comment also to everybody, to be able to educate um, women who are uh, already having some experience in technology and they're adults, but they have also a lot of potential. I have a feeling that in many 
like in the whole industry, there's this notion that maybe either it's too late for people to enter tech when they're adults, maybe when they have a degree in a, a different field. Mm -hmm. What would you say we should do? Like, um, we need, of course, funding for that. Like, I actually uh, founded a nonprofit organization recently as well, Women Plus Plus in Switzerland, and that's what we do. We organize free workshops for women, and there, it, it, we already see that it works. There are boot camps, women go there, educate themselves, and afterwards uh, build great things. So can, what can we do to shift this paradigm in people's mind that it's never too late, and we can shape the world now together and not in 10 years from now? Thanks. Any closing comments? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful thing to, to, to end on. Um, very good question. So, so completely agree. So, so I will say first, I don't entirely agree that. So I've already said this at the beginning that that um, the work that we're doing now with with education will only manifest itself in years from now because um, there are students who are being educated right now who are immediately sort of going into to do in, you know get inspired in one class and then immediately go into to do an internship. There are students again who are educated by AI for all who have published papers in the last year, even even as high school students. So um, some of the education efforts uh, with students are actually making a difference now and are paying off immediately. It's not 10 or 20 years down the line. Um, that being said, completely agree about um, bringing more people in and, and diversity uh, in terms of people who may have worked in another field and that are coming back to AI. That's um, very beneficial. Lots of things we can do about that. I will um, maybe, I guess we're out of time, so maybe I'll conclude and I'm happy to talk more offline about this and about concrete um, solutions and ways to do that. Excellent. Perfect. Yes, we are unfortunately out of time, but just as a reminder, we have another panel tomorrow, AI and Society, where we'll particularly delve also into those questions and data ownership and, and so on. But yeah, let me just finish this by saying thank you all for being here, for giving wonderful, inspiring talks and participating in the discussion. You know, some of you have to run. Um, yeah, big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.